we will begin our lightning rounds. So um, I hope you've enjoyed everything so far. If so, how about a round of applause for all of our faculty and staff? So the lightning presentations, the lightning round presentations that um, we're going to do right now are modeled after the style of uh, the uh, TED Talk, or sometimes you may have heard the term Ignite presentations. And uh, the speakers are going to detail their research in uh, about five minutes. So this is really good training um, for uh, all of our folks, whether you're faculty or whether you're staff. It's really great training for getting to the essence of what your research is all about and explaining it in a way that people can understand it, at least in the broad strokes. And, uh, you know, those of us in the academic world, uh, I would say traditionally this has not exactly been our forte, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, here today I think you're going to hear some uh, very good presentations. And what, here's what I'm going to do. I, I want to uh, let you know who is going to be doing presentations, and then I will announce them uh, as we go along. So you are going to see uh, Assistant Professor Jesse Berman and Shannon Sullivan, who is a PhD candidate from the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. They will be our uh, first group. And uh, then uh, Brian Hart and Roland Brown, who are both PhD candidates in the Division of Biostatistics. Associate Professor Shalini Colossingham and Haley Miller, who is a master's student from the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health. And then last, and certainly not least, Assistant Professor Eva Enns and uh, Zhou Kao, uh, who is a PhD student from the Division of Health Policy and Management. And if you have uh, downloaded the app or you've got the printed program, you will be able to see much more information about uh, each speaker and about their talk. So, without further ado, let me introduce Jesse Berman and Shannon Sullivan from the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. All right, thank you very much. I'm uh, excited to have the opportunity to present here for Research Day and speak about some of my work on extreme weather and uh, the impact on human health, in particular my work on drought and health risks in older U.S. adults. So the United Nations refers to drought as one of the most far-reaching of all natural disasters. And when we think about a drought condition, an image such as this usually comes into most people's minds. Uh, you know, here a child is uh, in East Africa is looking at the impact of drought on um, their livestock. Or people might alternatively think of an image like this, where these women in India need to now travel long distances to find potable and healthy uh, water to bring back to their families. But far less frequently do we think of images such as this. And here's a farmer here in the United States dealing with the drought of uh, Texas in 2011. And we don't think about the impacts of people here in the developed world and how it might impact individuals as well as the communities around them. So one of the things about drought, it's really this equal opportunity natural disaster. It impacts every single place in the world. And uh, just as some examples, in 2011, 2012, there was a drought that covered almost 66% of the continental US and impacted just about 150 million people. And the drought in California, which was the recent event, um, that was the most severe event in the last 1,200 years. So these are really very severe major um, events that impact very large geographic areas. But despite this, there's almost a total lack of research on drought-related health effects. So why is this so? One of the things is that drought exposure is really complex to define. If we were talking about a heat wave, we might say, well, when did one start? Or when did one end? And you can go pick up a thermometer and tell me the answer. But if we said, well, when did a drought start? Or when was a drought most severe? These are far more complex questions to answer. In addition, there's over 100 different metrics for drought. This is an example of just three measures across the same time frame in 2017. 
and you can see that even though they are, look similar, there are differences in terms of both uh, severity as well as geographic extent. On that same note, there's multiple health outcomes that can possibly be caused by drought exposure. We can consider things such as cardiovascular effects from increased dust. We consider respiratory impacts from changes in pollen and fungi uh, concentrations and spores in the air, as well as the impact of mental health effects, this natural disaster that really impacts communities and people's livelihoods and the impact that this will have on individuals. Finally, drought's really associated with a lot of potential confounders. This is a dust storm in uh, Phoenix, Arizona in 2011, and there's you know, increased prevalence of events such as these and wildfires due to uh, droughts. So my research uh, that I've done is really focused on the epidemiological investigation of how drought impacts uh, health. And we did a large study in the western U.S., uh, 14 years in 22 states uh, west of the Mississippi River. And we examined cardiovascular and respiratory-related hospital admissions, as well as total deaths uh, in the country. And we used a two-stage model to really estimate the risk of a health outcome during a drought compared to non-drought condition. So what were the major findings of this? Just as a real nitty-gritty, we found that during high-severity worsening drought periods, there was a statistically significant increase in all-cause mortalities due to drought exposure. At the same time, there was a significant decrease in the number of respiratory admissions during a full drought compared to a non-drought period. And while we didn't see any effect with a statistically significant effect with cardiovascular admissions, we saw this strong trend of increasing hospitalizations during, um, as drought conditions got more severe. And furthermore, we found that in areas that don't experience frequent droughts, places like Minnesota, when a drought event does occur, the risk estimates for those areas were far greater than areas where droughts have more frequent occurrence, such as Arizona or Texas. So what are the major implications of this? Number one, this work really demonstrated that there are measurable and previously unidentified adverse health effects from drought exposure. And we know that under future climate change scenarios, we anticipate increased severity and duration of drought events. So this isn't a problem that's going away. This is something which is going to become you know, more prevalent and more common in the future. I think there's a lot of great future research opportunities in this field, namely to look at other health outcomes, the most important one being mental health, but also how vector-borne disease like tick populations might be impacted by changes of drought, as well as different cardiovascular disease types. In addition, we want to really look at how disparities in population variability in health effects really occur when you have these drought exposures in such vast different geographic areas. So this is work that I'm really excited about. I think there's a lot of opportunity here, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to spending my time here to look into some of this other stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. Appreciate that very much. That's a really good example of what a lightning talk is. Um, and I can tell you that uh, when we did our st strategic plan, um, SPH 2030, really looking at what we need to be strong in as a school for the year 2030, climate change is absolutely one of those areas. It's having an impact not just on emerging infectious disease, but as you saw, it will have an impact on chronic disease as well. Thank you, really. That's just terrific work. Okay, we uh, now move along to Brian Hart and Roland Brown, and I guess Brian is going to uh, give our talk, uh, and uh, they are from the uh, Division of Biostatistics. Please welcome Brian Hart. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for coming out and being part of Research Day, and thanks for allowing me to talk. So I'm going to give... Uh, I'm a fourth-year biostatistics PhD student, and I am going to talk about some work I've been doing with my advisor, Dr. Mark Piekis, on capturing multi-subject brain activity. So recently, in the neuroimaging world, there's been uh, a large set of many times publicly available data sets so, that are looking at specific diseases that we understand have some sort of neurological component, but we are trying to better understand what's going on inside the brain both structurally and functionally. So for an example, we have the ADNI, which is looking at Alzheimer's disease. There's a large database looking at Parkinson's disease, and then also looking at conditions such as autism, but also just trying to understand what does normal cognitive development look like 
when you're looking at the structure and the activity of the brain. So each of these is collecting many different types of neuroimaging. There's all sorts of acronyms, fMRI, MRI, DTI, EEG. These are all sort of technologies that are looking at what does the structure of the brain look like as people progress through a disease or through a health state or as people are just naturally um, going through adolescence or aging. And um, so each of these data sets has a specific question and we want to better understand the underlying processes of these data sets to help better understand the disease to help us improve treatment and diagnosis of each of these conditions. And to take full advantage of these data sets, which have potentially hundreds or thousands of subjects, we need better statistical methodologies to sort of harness the full power of the data. So specifically my work, my most recent work has been on electroencephalography or EEG data. And many of you have probably seen a picture of somebody getting an EEG, you put on the skull cap and there's electrodes placed all over their head. And at each electrode, what it's doing is it's measuring the electrical activity at that location on the skull to try to get at the activity of the brain at that location. So we have this, this EEG data recorded, and what we're doing is we're estimating what's known as the power spectrum. So the technical definition is here, it's a smooth curve that shows a proportion of the total variance of a time series, or EEG recording, that can be explained by waveforms at each frequency. So what the heck does that mean? I have two examples of what you might get out of an EEG recording here, and then there, the power spectra from those recordings. So the top one you can see is sort of a slower moving wave. It has this sort of slow up and down movement that's dominated by, it's called low frequency, so you see the, the peak in that spectral density on the right is sort of off in the left low frequency area. Likewise, the, uh, the bottom EEG recording has lots of rapid back and forth movement. That's called high frequency signal and its associated power spectra has this peak up on the far right side. So these power spectra are telling us something about the underlying EEG recordings, the, the brain activity that's going on in each subject. So this is sort of our goal metric to analyze from each of these subjects. And the data that we're working on is a large twin study that's um, been collected here at Minnesota. So what's really nice about the Minnesota twin family study and twin studies in general is that you know uh, monozygotic or identical twins share 100% of their genetic material, and dizygotic or fraternal twins share 50% of the genetic material on average. So you can look at the difference there and to help you better understand how much of the differences between people or the variation in a trait can be sort of explained by their genetic material. And that's what's known as heritability. So we are looking here as a first step in this analysis of these so there's about 1,100 twins in this study, and we want to understand of these power spectra curves, sort of how much of the differences between subjects can be explained by their genetic material. And we've run this analysis, and it turns out that 65% of the differences between subjects is, uh, can be explained by genetics. So it's clear that the, the brain signals the collect, as collected by the EEG machine, there is some sort of genetic component to the activity of the brain. So this has been sort of the first step in this analysis. But as I referenced earlier, there's a lot of uh, sort of, this is an adolescent cohort, so we'd like to understand things like what is, sort of how does this change across time, cognitive development, and many of these, there's also behavioral and psychological data collected on this. So we'd like to understand how both the genetic component and uh, sort of the, the neuroimaging or neurological component are interacting with conditions such as substance abuse or depression or any other uh, mental health condition that uh, has been collected in this data set. Thank you all. And uh, why that is important is that I think the brain, as far as human organs are concerned, is the last frontier that we really don't understand very, very well. But this is great because this is really starting to help us understand what the parameters are and then presumably gives us a sort of a biologic baseline that we'll be able to see how this, you know, uh, changes happen over time when we're talking about Alzheimer's or dementia or, or substance abuse. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. All right. And we now move to our third presentation. And uh, it is my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Associate Professor Shalini Colossingham in the Division of Epidemiology and Community 
health. And uh, this is research that uh, uh, Professor uh, Colossingham and Haley Miller have done together. Please welcome Shalini Colossingham. Thank you. So, um, as Dean Finnegan said, I'm Shalini Kulasingam. I'm in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about the human papillomavirus, or HPV, vaccine. HPV is a sexually transmitted virus that causes cancer and genital warts. Genital warts are cauliflower-like growths that occur in the genital region. So despite this pretty picture of the virus, this is one of the bad guys. In 2001, I was working on my dissertation with Professor Laura Kautsky from the University of Washington. Laura at the time was a principal investigator of a study that was looking at whether the vaccine could prevent disease in vaccinated women. She called me into her office, told me to close the door, and said, Shalini, I just received the results from the study, and guess what? There was no disease in the vaccinated woman. And my response was an Wow, this is amazing. My response was, oh my gosh, my career is over and it hasn't even started. <laughs> so right after that, I moved to Duke University because I wanted to learn about simulation modeling. And this is my first postdoctoral paper. And it was simulating the impact that this vaccine would have on a US population of women that had been vaccinated against HPV. But the thing that I want you to note, and these were unofficial estimates coming out of the CDC before the vaccine had been approved, was that approximately 70% of eligible girls would be vaccinated when this vaccine became available. A couple of years after that, I was approached by a small company in Australia that held one of the four patents on this vaccine. And they said, Shlini, can you work with us to put in a submission to the Australian government so that this vaccine can be approved? So over the course of a year and a half, I did just that. We submitted it to the Australian government. And as a result, Australia was the first country in the world to approve the vaccine. Shortly thereafter, the US approved the vaccine. Which brings me to my question, how are we doing compared to the Australians? And the short answer is, we're not doing that well. So why is that? Well, one thing, oops, to keep in mind is that Australia's HPV vaccination is national and it's also school-based. That means any adolescent attending school is offered this vaccine. What that also means is that very early on, after this vaccine was approved, they, re they achieved high vaccine coverage. 80% of their eligible population was vaccinated. <clears throat> and if you look at the current numbers coming out of Australia, they have achieved a 90% reduction in warts, a 50% reduction in cervical precancer, and in the coming decade, they are expected to achieve significant reductions in their HPV-related cancers. So what about us? Well, what about us? So our coverage is at 60%, but that's right now. When this vaccine was initially approved, it was only at about 30% in girls. And this is what you see nationwide, but look at what's going on between states, right? So we have varying coverage, and the thing to note is that Minnesota, in this case, is in fact below average which is something that I think for all of you, because we're used to being above average, it's like, what? So, what are some of the reasons for this? Well, one is, this was initially marketed as a vaccine that prevents a sexually transmitted infection. And there's one thing that I really think is true about our country, which is that we are prudes when it comes to sex. Stormy Daniels aside, we just have a real big issue talking about sex. So what's the other thing? Well, this is a vaccine that has had a lot of negative press in terms of its safety profile. And this is despite a body of evidence that suggests quite the contrary. So where do we go from here? Well, one thing that we know is that there is a strong evidence base that shows that if we can empower clinicians to talk about this vaccine, that a clinician recommendation is something that parents, even vaccine hesitant parents, will listen to. So we need to work with clinicians in order to make them feel comfortable talking about this vaccine. The next thing is, we need to change the narrative on this vaccine. 
This isn't a vaccine that prevents an STI. This is a vaccine that prevents cancer. Which parent is going to say no to preventing cancer in their kid? And I want to point this out because this is a campaign that the American Cancer Society is going to launch in June, and we're actually working with them. And as you know, HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. Last but not least, we know this in public health. We have to collaborate. And these are some of the groups that are collaborating nationally and locally in order to increase HPV vaccination. So what I can tell you is, over 15 years ago, I thought my career was over before it had even started. But what I can tell you, quite frankly, is that in the coming decade, if someone were to tell me, Shalini, it's time to move on, I would be more than happy to do so. Thank you. You know, it, this just is, fascinates me about public health challenges because it's not just about having the technology like a vaccine. You've also got to have the public policy. You've also got to have the education and the communication. So you can have all the good technology in the world, but if people don't use it, then Minnesota ends up being below average. Uh, it's just really shocking. And you've got to have systems in place as well. This is just terrific research. Thank you very much, Shalini. All right, and we come to our final uh, lightning round. Um, this is uh, research uh, done by uh, professor, Assistant Professor Eva Enns and Zoe Kao, a PhD student from the Division of Health Policy and Management. And Zoe, I think you are, no? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Roland, okay. I, 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 my big apology. <laughs> okay, so Roland is a PhD candidate in the Division of Biostatistics, and you're on. <laughs> All right, so as Dean Finnegan said, I'm a fourth year PhD student in Biostat, and I'm going to talk about some work that I've done with uh, uh, Professor Julian Wolfson and some uh, other folks over in the Humphrey School. So over the last few decades, our ability to quantify human health has improved dramatically. We, uh, as the prices of genetic sequencing and imaging modalities have gone down, we're now able to capture many different aspects of our physical state, and as a result, are beginning to understand how these affect our health. But at the same time, while we know that our habits and our behaviors also affect, have large health impacts, we understand little about the nature of these impacts or how to motivate the requisite behavior change. So what, why is this? Well, one of the major reasons is that uh, obstacles is that we are not able to collect reliable behavior data. So most traditional methods use either direct observation, which is prohibitively expensive, or, um, or self-report, where reliability is contingent upon the individual subjects themselves, who, like our uh, chagrined lady here, are fabulously bad at reporting on their own behavior. So a method for cheap collection of reliable behavior data would be a major step in the right direction. And a lot of the sort of advances in this area rely on sensor technology. These include specialized devices like Fitbits, as well as the sensors that are embedded in the smartphones that you and I carry with us every day. And smartphones contain a wide range of different sensors, but I'll talk just about two in particular. GPS, which measures speed and location, sort of large-scale data, and accelerometers, which quantify the finer grain details of, of activity and movement. So here's what some of these raw sensor data look like. In the top plot, we see location data measured as longitude and latitude. The bottom two plots, we see speed and acceleration quantified as magnitudes over time. But on their own, these data provide little in the way of useful or actionable insights about the links between behavior and health. And so this is what has motivated research that I've been, the research group, to develop uh, an app called Dynamica, which uses various machine learning and other algorithms to convert these raw sensor data into uh, a daily summary like you see on the right. And we do this all with minimal user input. And so time, we can see, is partitioned into what we call activities, denoted in black text, and trips, denoted in green text. And activities capture how we spend the majority of time. For example, at home, work, eating out, or, or, um, or shopping. And trips quantify how we move from activity to activity. We might have, so Dynamica captures trip modes of walk, bike, car, bus, and rail. 
So in our example here, we can see that our individual left home at 8.14 a.m., took the train to grab breakfast before going to work for eight hours, and then returned home around 5 p.m. by the same route. Now we recognize that our machine learning algorithms are not 100% accurate, so we allow users to edit incorrectly inferred data using a screen like you see on the left panel. Additionally, users can augment their trip and activity data with additional information about their emotional state, their disposition, as well as other details relevant to the trip and activity. And so these details are customizable, which allows Dynamica to be employed in a wide range of different applications. So the potential public health uses for this are, are, are many, and I'm, so I'm going to focus on a few general themes and a few specific examples. But these are by no means exhaustive, and many of you might be able to employ Dynamica to augment your own data collection and your own research. So first, Dynamica might be used to characterize behavior patterns associated with health outcomes. An example of this might be monitoring exercise patterns in peripheral artery disease patients in rehab or identifying behavioral signatures associated with changes in symptoms of mental illness. The detailed data provided by Dynamica could also be used to enhance provider-patient discussions about healthy habits and behaviors, and it could also be used to optimize and dynamically deliver behavioral interventions, something that we have found notoriously difficult to do. And finally, this is a plug for my poster presentation. Uh, the, the individual high-resolution data provided by Dynamica can be used in, con in tandem with some novel statistical methodology to enable high precision individual level inference. So for the last bit here, I'm just gonna show some neat visualizations and things you can do with the Dynamica data. This is applied to a data set of 370 Minneapolis area individuals who use the app for one week each. So this is what we call the timeline, the timeline view for one user over one week of data. Each row represents a day from midnight to midnight and separate blocks represent different activities of different types. So we can see that our user is a student, indicated by the purple education blocks on November 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, and also that our student has a non-standard work schedule, indicated by the work blocks on 11.5 and 11.6, early in the morning. We can also look, oops, we can also look at uh, outcomes over time. So here we see uh, self-reported happiness levels for car trips and walk trips as a function of trip duration. We can see that for shorter durations, happiness levels are similar between car and walk, but as duration increases, people become less happy in the car and happier on their walking trips. We can look at outcomes in geographical space. This is a spatially smooth heat map of self-reported happiness levels for a particular region of the Twin Cities. And finally, we've recently developed a time use animation. In this animation, dots represent a person day, and as we advance time in the top left corner, we can watch as our users move from trips to activities to trips to activities. So, Briefly, here are the past and present research members of the Dynamica group. They've all contributed in some way to this work. And if you have any questions or are interested in using Dynamica for your own research, please don't hesitate to contact me or one of the other members. Thank you. So, Mark Zuckerberg on steroids. That is uh, really fascinating stuff. And it, it is a, another area where the school does want to advance in and be a lot stronger, which is, you know, how can we use digital technology for, for uh, public health purposes? But boy, if you want to talk about protecting data security, I would say uh, that that's a good example of something we would pay attention to, right? But there's hidden patterns in these data that we just don't know anything about. So uh, uh, well done, and I think we're going to see a lot more, especially as more wearable technology advances. It is now my pleasure to present Assistant Professor Eva Enns and, um, uh, from the Division of Health Policy and Management. And is this research that you've done with Zoe Kao as well? Please welcome Eva Enns. Thank you, Dean Finnegan. Um, so I'm going to be co-presenting with uh, Zoe Cow, who's a PhD candidate in our program in the health, uh, Division of Health Policy and Management. So networks are salient in our everyday lives. Um, social and professional networking sites have made our networks more visible and allowed people to capitalize on their social circles and the social circles of others. We've also become more aware of the impact that networks have on our everyday lives. So we've seen the influence that our social networks have on our habits and lifestyle choices, our 
uh, chances of getting the flu and our chances of finding a job. So we're really reminded on a daily basis that we live in a connected world. Networks in their essence describe interactions. Formally, a network model consists of a population of individuals and connections between those individuals. These connections can represent a variety of relationships. These might be uh, professional interactions, friendships, or sexual partnerships. And it's over these connections that things spread. And depending on the nature of the relationships of interest, these might be uh, things like information, attitudes, behaviors, and of course, infectious disease, which is my area of research. <clears throat> so network structure has a huge influence on how a disease spreads through a population, but we often don't know the network structure. Uh, here are two examples of different network structures. Individuals in these populations have the same number of contacts on average, but you can see these, these structures look very different. So on the left, we have what's called a random network. And here, individuals are just randomly connected to each other um, with very little pattern or variation in behavior. On the right, we have a scale-free network, and this network is characterized by most people having just a few contacts, one or two connections, uh, whereas then we have a small number of extremely connected individuals, and those are the large green circles. And those individuals act as hubs in the network, and so if they become infected, then they're going to rapidly spread the infection throughout the network. So network structure and its influence on how a disease spreads has been fairly well established. But what has been less studied is how network structure influences the effectiveness of interventions aimed at preventing or controlling infectious disease spread. And so that's really the focus of our research team. So sexually transmitted infections like chlamydia and gonorrhea are two examples of uh, infections that spread over a sexual contact network. These infections are treatable with antibiotics, but they rarely produce symptoms, so a person often has no idea that they're infected. When left untreated, these infections can lead to complications, um, such as a painful condition called pelvic inflammatory disease that can lead to infertility. Um, <clears throat> and so it's really important to diagnose these infections and treat people. So because there are very few symptoms, routine testing is really the foundation of STI control. For example, the, uh, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommend that sexually active women under the age of 25 and men who have sex with men of any age be tested annually for STIs, whether or not they have any symptoms or think that they have an STI. <clears throat> but routine STI testing really focuses just on the individual, right? And it ignores the broader sexual network of which a person is a part, including potentially infected individuals. So while we can treat that person who tests positive for the STI, we may be leaving infections in the network, allowing the STI to spread further, but also putting our original patient at risk of reinfection. So routine STI testing can be improved by combining it with contact tracing. Under contact tracing, uh, when a person tests positive for an STI, they're asked to provide the names and contact information of their most recent sexual partners. Staff then contact those partners and offer them testing, and hopefully they get tested. And then if any of those partners test positive, their most recent sexual contacts are traced, contacted, tested, and so on. And so this can lead to many more infections being treated. The downside of contact tracing, of course is a downside, right, is that it's extremely labor intensive. You have to go and find these people, contact them, test them. Um, and so we really need to think about whether or not the benefit of treating these additional STI cases is worth the cost of doing so. It also seems clear, right, that contact tracing is going to be influenced by the network structure because this process is essentially tracing through the sexual contact network. And so the question is, what does this relationship look like? How does network structure influence the effectiveness of contact tracing? So now I will hand it over to Zoe to prevent, present our model. Thanks, Eva. So um, to, to systematically compare um, compare the performance of different interventions across different network structures, we created a simulation model of a hypothetical STI spreading over a sexual contact network. And a simulation model is a, is a simplified version of reality that allows us to experiment with different scenarios to see what might happen. So to compare two STI measurement strategies, 
we created a simulated world with routine STI testing only. Uh, and also, we also created another simulated world with both STI testing and contact tracing respective, uh, uh, in the same simulated world. The metric we use for evaluating different intervention is the annual number of STI cases. In addition, we introduced the structure of sexual contact network to our simulation model, including the uh, random network and the scale-free network. In the random network, individuals have equal chance to make sexual contact with anybody in the population. In comparison, in the scale-free network, uh, there are some hubs, which means that individuals have higher number of sexual partners compared to the rest of the population. Therefore, we expect that these hubs will facilitate STI spreading over the scale-free network. Here is an example from, uh, from our simulation model. So, as we expected, the number of uh, STI cases in the scale-free network is 61% higher than the number of cases in the random network. After introducing contact tracing uh, in the random network, contact tracing resulted in, in lower number of STI cases, reduced the cases by, by half. However, in the scale-free network, contact tracing resulted in a higher number of STI cases, which is counterintuitive, because contact tracing should always treat more inf infection in the population compared to uh, routine STI testing only. And why is that? Uh, the key is the highly connected individuals in the scale-free network. These individuals are easily, infect are easily infected because they have many partners. And having many partners also means that uh, they are more likely to be named as a contact through contact tracing Therefore, these highly infected individuals enter into a cycle of infection, being traced, being tested, treated, only to be quickly reinfected again. This suggests that in a scale-free network, contact tracing should, should be complemented by interventions uh, aiming at reducing uh, risky sexual behavior. So the research from our team indicates that uh, network information is very important for informing infectious disease policy. Intervention can have very different impacts on, uh, on the disease outcome depending on, uh, sorry, de depending on the, the underlying network structure. So in continuing work, we are exploring the cases where uh, optimal policy decision is different depending on the network structure. And in these cases, we can quantify the value of information and determine whether it is worth collecting more data in a population's content network. Thank you for your attention. All right, please welcome Shannon Sullivan. Thank you, Dean Finnegan. In addition to being a PhD student, I'm also a researcher at the Masonic Cancer Center, working on a team whose ultimate goal is to understand how we can prevent lung cancer. And I'm here today to tell you about just one study that's part of a much larger research program. More than six million people will die this year from smoking. The majority of these deaths will be to lung cancer. And that's despite researchers making great strides in understanding how tobacco causes disease, public health professionals educating people on the harms related to tobacco use and exposure, and the implementation of policies and interventions to help reduce tobacco use. The reality is people are still smoking, and people will continue to die from tobacco-related diseases such as lung cancer. Unless, imagine, what if we could identify those smokers who are at greatest risk of developing lung cancer? What if we could then use this knowledge 
to develop targeted, effective interventions and treatments. I'm involved in a project that aims to do exactly this. Using a large prospective cohort called the Multi-Ethnic Cohort Study, my colleagues have found that lung cancer risk due to smoking differs across race ethnicity groups and between sex, even at similar levels of smoking. For example, African American males and female smokers are at a greater risk of developing and dying from lung cancer than anybody from any other race ethnicity group, even if they smoke the same number of cigarettes for the same amount of time. And although exposure to cancer-causing chemicals from tobacco may be somewhat similar among smokers, extensive ev evidence suggests that the metabolism and DNA damage and repair in response to these chemicals varies and can partly explain the differing patterns of smoking and lung cancer risk. Yet knowing all of this, we still cannot pinpoint who will exactly develop lung cancer. In fact, not all smokers will develop lung cancer over their lifetime. So what is it about some smokers that makes them more susceptible to this disease? Our study is trying to answer that question. We think that together with the already identified risk factors, exposure to cancer-causing chemicals from additional sources is adding to the risk of lung cancer development in some smokers. One cancer-causing chemical that we are particularly interested in is cadmium. Cadmium is a naturally occurring element found in the Earth's crust. And we are interested in cadmium because cadmium is known to cause cancer in the lung and because smokers can be exposed to cadmium in a few different ways. One way is through smoking a cigarette. And that is because the cadmium in the soil is readily taken up by the tobacco plant. So when a person smokes a cigarette, the cadmium is transferred from the burning tobacco into the smoke and then is inhaled into the lungs. Another important way is through occupational exposures because cadmium is also an environmental and industrial pollutant. And certain industries, like the mining industry, poses a high risk for cadmium exposure. It has also been suggested that certain genes might affect cadmium toxicity and may affect the amount of cadmium that is in our body and can contribute to, can, and can uh, make people more susceptible to its toxic effects. So we know that smoking leads to cadmium exposure. We know that certain occupations expose people to cadmium. And we know that certain genes might contribute to the variation of cadmium levels in some smokers. We know how all of these factors play a role individually. What we don't know is how all these factors play a role together and affect cadmium levels in the body and lung cancer risk in smokers. So we've designed a study using current smokers who are representative of five different ethnic groups to do this. We want to know if smokers working in certain occupations with genes that make them more susceptible to cadmium have higher levels of cadmium in their body. And then we want to develop and test an algorithm that uses all of this information and smoking history to predict lung cancer risk. Imagine if we could identify those smokers. How many people could we knock off this devastating mortality statistic? Thank you. I'd say we're moving rapidly into precision public health. It's so interesting to see the uses of big data and this fits very much with the innovation concepts that we have in mind here. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Haley Miller, who is a master's student from the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health. Haley. Thank you. Um, like Dr. Dean Finnegan um, said, my name is Haley Miller and I'm in the Community Health Promotion and PH program. And today I'm going to be talking about my work with Fairview on a project called Live Well, Lead Well. So how many in this room, from some point to another, experience work-related stress? Probably most of us. As 8 in 10 Americans say that 
they are stressed in their work. 25% of Americans report their job as being the number one stressor in their life. Stress can lead to a lot of negative health impacts, and annually, $300 billion is spent on health care and missed work days due to workplace stress, among other factors. So to me, this is concerning, and it's what has sparked some of my interest in this area of public health. So now if you consider that working adults spend one-third of their day, five days a week, generally, in the workplace, this, along with long hours, high work demands, poor support, change in roles and job security, all have the potential to lead to some negative health impacts. Some of the ones that we see specifically in the workplace include low employee morale, poor retention, decreased productivity, absenteeism, and again, high health care costs. But in the midst of these negative health impacts, the workplace has become an important place to intervene on some of these issues. Implementation of worksite wellness programs has the potential to impact long-term lifestyle choices of employees. I have been collaborating with the employee well-being team at Fairview, working to create an online wellness toolkit. This toolkit is aimed at leaders within the organization as they are really in a critical spot to influence employee well-being and serve as role models in their organization. So the project is called Live Well, Lead Well, and the goal of this is to provide resources for engaging employees in well-being, in addition to helping promote health as a business priority. Now we often think of well-being encompassing physical activity, nutrition primarily, However, it extends far beyond that. The current wellness model at Fairview encompasses these six core dimensions of well-being. It's adapted from Tom Rath and Jim Harder's book titled The Five Essential Elements of Well-Being. And the resources in this toolkit target each of these core areas in some way or another. The resources range from discussion guides that spark conversation about well-being to ideas for engaging in team wellness challenges. We are currently in the process of revising and evaluating the toolkit, but our hope is that within the next month or two, this resource will be available to all employees at Fairview. So you might ask, why target workplaces? Well, organizations that have adapted some of these similar worksite wellness programs or other health initiatives have seen substantial improvements in the health outcomes of their employees, and has also led to reductions in chronic disease. Um, and I think work sites are really starting to catch on and recognize that these programs can benefit not only individual employees, but also the overall success of the organization. And some of the health outcomes that we see include improved productivity, greater employee engagement, and again, reductions in chronic disease. And I think all of us here in our own workplaces can really have a stake in reaping these benefits. So as I've mentioned, the goal with this toolkit is really to provide easy to use resources to leaders, um, specifically at Fairview and hopefully other organizations, that can allow them to help promote a culture of well-being within the organization. And as this picture illustrates, um, the next step is hopefully creating a healthier future for those in the workforce. And I'm really excited to continue doing this work and help in making that change. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. A round of applause for all our presenters. Absolutely great work, thank you. So um, I'm a, a, a refugee from the, uh, the analog world, right? And uh, when I started here on staff and as a junior faculty member, um, we were doing some work, working with communities to help, to help them uh, develop uh, approaches to um, worksite health and wellness. 
And uh, I am so glad to see that that kind of work is continuing even in the digital age. And now I think we have even better tools than we had years ago. <laughs> Notice I wasn't precise there. Okay, well now we come to the really fun part of the program. And this is about our awards presentations. And I'm going to uh, ask uh, Beth uh, Vernig to come up because I think Beth or let's see Sarah you coming up too okay all right we have uh, we have a lot of awards to give out here and um, and I hope you agree that bigger ideas yield bigger results bigger imagination okay we'll go up here we'll go up here all right, so in addition to honoring our students for the hard work for Research Day, we're also going to announce the recipients of the Outstanding Faculty Achievement Awards. And uh, what has become uh, our practice in the last few years is that we've chosen uh, to make these faculty awards on this day, on Research Day, um, to share with our students and uh, with the SPH community um, and many of you participated in the nomination of our faculty for these awards. So, first up are the Best Student Poster Awards. These are the student abstracts in correlation with their poster presentations. They were judged on various merits, including topic prominence, presentation objectives, purpose, practice, impact, academic impact, originality, tone, and overall excellence. Wow, that's a high bar. No question of it. So, we begin with the master's degree awards. Second place, I'm sorry, third place goes to Alexandra Alchiva. Congratulations, well done. I think Tim Rummelhoff should get an award too. We'll work on that. <laughs> Second place, Miko Gambin. I didn't know you had a fan club. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tim. And first place for the master's degree awards, Whitney Kester. Excellent, congratulations to the master's degree award winners. And next we move to the awards for the doctoral level students. Third place goes to Manami Bhattacharya. <laughs> Long walk, yes. Congratulations, Manami. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Second place goes to Melanie Firestone. Very good. 
And first place for the doctoral level students, Katie Tastad. Okay, now we move to the first place posters, and these are going to be displayed outside the SPH uh, Dean's Office for the coming semester. Now, the award category chosen by you, the People's Choice Award. I feel like we're at the Golden Globes or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, we need music, right. Okay, the People's Choice Awards. This year's recipients in the master's degree First place, Patrick Malone. And PhD, first place, People's Choice Award, Manami Bhattacharya. Sorry, Manami, another long walk. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. Yeah. Congratulations. All right. A round of applause for all of our student winners. So we now move to present the Outstanding Faculty Achievement Awards. And the school, this is really important because this, this really recognizes faculty for the superb work that they do in working with students and in working uh, in the classroom as well. And while, yes, it's part of our job as faculty to do these things, in fact, these awards are going to faculty who go that extra mile, and that is really important. So, the School of Public Health Award for Excellence in Advising goes to Dr. Alan Lifson, Professor, Epidemiology and Community Health. And as Alan is coming up here, I, I want to read a student letter of support, and it reads this way. Dr. Lifson exemplifies the ideal qualities of an advisor, academic or otherwise. His dedication to his many students sets a high bar for other advisors at the University of Minnesota. Even outside of his direct advisees, Dr. Lifson helps drive students to discover both in the graduate program and ultimately in the field. He treats everyone as a colleague, learning as much from us as we do from him. High praise indeed. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Well, well done. Nice. Congratulations, Alan. That's terrific. Well done. The uh, highest award that uh, the school has to honor the teaching of our faculty is the Leonard M. Schumann Award for Excellence in Teaching. And um, I think some of you that are my age or a little younger or a little older certainly remember uh, Leonard Schumann. He was an amazing epidemiologist, uh, an unusual epidemiologist because he worked both on the chronic disease side of epi as well as on the infectious disease side. And you don't see that much anymore. We've specialized a great deal more. But people who took Leonard Schumann's courses uh, know what teaching excellence is all about. He was an amazing man. And so we named this award uh, after Leonard to honor uh, his work. And by the way, in case you don't know, a little piece of history, uh, Leonard was the leader in establishing the PhD program in epidemiology in this school, which was the first PhD program in epi in the United States. So uh, 
This is really significant. So, the Leonard M. Schumann Award for Excellence in Teaching is awarded to Dr. Ruby Wynn. Ruby is Associate Professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health, and I want to read just a little bit of, a, of a, an excerpt from a letter of support for this nomination. Dr. Wynn's tireless instruction and endless patience made my career possible. Teaching isn't just something that she excels at. It's something that defines her and it makes her one of the most effective teachers I've ever had the pleasure to learn from. Congratulations to Ruby Wynn. Well done. Congratulations to all our winners today. Please, a round of applause. So I want to thank all of you for, for joining us today. Um, this is a, a slightly different format from what we've had in the past. Uh, I think it's pretty successful. I hope you do. And as always, we uh, want to get your input. And I'm also sure that the presentations that you heard today in the lightning round and perhaps in some of the poster sessions have sparked a lot of questions. So I invite you to stay a bit. Excuse me? I intend to, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's on my list. <laughs> so uh, please do stick around. Uh, our uh, speakers as well as our uh, poster presenters will be here for a little bit. And I think that uh, if you uh, want a little more time with them, this would be the best time to do it. And finally, no event like this is possible without the help of quite a number of our staff and I'm very appreciative of all of the work that our staff have put into this. But especially, I am appreciative of the work of Anisha Tucker, without which we would not have had this great event. And thank you all. That concludes our program right now. And I hope you'll stick around and talk.